Um, hello, welcome. I guess I'm the speaker, so I'm, I was going to uh, kick this off by saying big up to I and Alicia. <laughs> Okay, so a um, uh, really quick introduction. I'm the more free uh, Red Aid for Industries, which is um, downtown Manhattan, so I, I got to take the seven here. And um, I've been doing open source hardware and, and selling it as part of this business since 2006. And um, I have really good news. All the people who've heard me talk, I'm actually not going to talk about my business um, because I and Alicia said, hey, we want uh, you know pragmatic, hobbyist, uh, you know, solutions-based driven stuff, and I was like, okay, you know, I'm not going to talk about all the details of shipping and manufacturing and, and licensing and all of that stuff. I'm actually going to talk about, uh, you know, why do open source hardware, and specifically why did I do open source hardware, and uh, maybe some reasons why you may want to do open source hardware if you don't. Um, so, okay, so we're going to rewind back to 2002 and 2003, and we're going to stop at 2006. So, it's all going to be... Uh, History. So, uh, you know, I grew up in Boston, and uh, Boston's sort of the seat of, you know, the FSF and the EFF used to be there too, and and so there's a lot of like, uh, you know, Linuxy, BSD people hanging out there, and I went to MIT, and so there was a culture of open source software. We sort of assumed that if you were going to work on something, it would be an open source software project, and you know, installing Linux and running it was totally cool, and Microsoft sucked, and and so when I started moving away from doing software and doing more electronics. Um, they were sort of, I had this, uh, you know, core of like, oh, open source software is good and I've seen the good it does. And so I was definitely inspired by that. So it's, just, it's not like I came up with, you know, open source hardware out of nowhere. It's, it's a derivative of open source software. And um, what I would do when I was learning electronics is that um, I would release stuff, like these are some early projects that I did, some development boards and stuff um, when I was in school. And um, I would release, you know, they'd have software or firmware, and I would release a software or firmware under like GPL or MIT or BSD license or anything, whatever the popular license at the time was. But I would put the files up, and I would just say, uh, you know, these are like the, the Eagle Cat files or the Gerber files, and I, I guess do what you want with them, but like the idea that you could even license them, I actually had no idea. I didn't know about like mask works or what was copyright, is it schematic copyright or is it patented or, or what. So I just put it up and he said, you know, whatever, you know, enjoy it yourself. So, um, for example, I'm going to go through some specific examples of projects and why I open sourced them or why I published them. So this was a project I did. This was actually, um, uh, you know, a little bike light wheel thing. And you spin the wheel and the lights display a message or an image like a biohazard. And um, actually, this project to learn microcontrollers because I was an engineer and learning electronics. And this seems like a cool thing. And, uh, uh, you know, my roommate was really into making uh, persons of vision art LED projects. Um, we made really big ones. And I was always like, hey, you know, like, I'd like to build this stuff too. You want to, like, show me how you do this stuff? And I was always kind of like, not really. Uh, you're on your own. And so I was like, all right, fine. So I downloaded um, a freeware version of EagleCAD. And, and you can see um, my circuit boards are only three inches long because that's the limit of EagleCAD. So I had to take three boards and then I'd staple them together. Um, so that's why it's done that way to make them long and fit on my bike wheel. Um, so, you know, when I, when I made this, I actually did many revisions, and this particular version I never put up because it, it's so embarrassing. Um, and, you know, I didn't feel like any, anyone needed to see it. It just went to Burning Man, and, and I rode around on it. And um, I ended up putting it online later when I revised it and made it better, and I put it under uh, a non-commercial license. And uh, I want to tell you that it doesn't matter whether you put something under a non-commercial license, because someone will probably come along and make a derivative anyways, and it'll be closed source, and they might be your ex-boyfriend. <laughs> okay, so I was telling you, like, if, and if this is going to happen, uh, from then on, I never did anything non-commercial. I never released anything under a Creative Commons non-commercial license, because I was like, wow, that really backfired. Um, so, uh, another project I did uh, to learn microcontrollers, this was a more complicated one, was making an MP3 player. Now, all of you old schoolers who were doing electronics in 2004 and 2003 probably remember that building MP3 players was the hot new thing. Everyone was building their own DIY MP3 players because there were MP3 chips. And I'd see all these people doing projects. I was like, wow, I really want to make my own. And because there were so many um, examples online, and people actually started to put up files and say, well, I don't know what license this would be under, but I guess it's free for you to use it any way you want. So I actually uh, got a kickstart and you know designed my own MP3 player and it, and it went into a mint tin 
Uh, and this is, you know, my uh, first breakout board PCB, and I can only afford two chips, so I had to desolder this one to make the final version, which is why all the chips were pulled off. Um, and um, because I did this project based on all these people's uh, generous donations of, of code examples, even if it was in another language or I uh, used different chips, because I used all these examples, and that was how I really learned a lot about microcontrollers and electronics, I said, well, you know, like, I should give back, right? So that's why I put those files up online and uh, for free to use. And a lot of people ended up making these, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, people contacted me and were like, yeah, you know, this was in the slash dot, this was in the New York Times, and it was on a bunch of other sites, and everyone was like, oh, man, I'm totally going to, like, make and sell these, because you put the files online, you said it's totally cool, and, and I got a lot of people who, you know, even showed me, like, here are prototypes, and I'm going to make manufacture these, and it's like, okay, well, you know, I'm still in school, and, like, that's good, I guess. I was kind of a, a little upset, because I was like, well, you're making money off of something, that I kind of gave away for free, and I didn't really even consider this possibility. But uh, it turns out that it didn't work out anyways, because, um, you know, Apple had the iPod. So, it, you know, it doesn't matter, right? So saying that people, you know, I have so many projects where I'll release them, and I'll get like 20 people emailing me like, oh, I'm going to manufacture these and sell them on Canal Street. And it, it turns out that it's a little more complicated uh, than just that. And then, uh, you know, okay, so I know a little bit about electronics, but it's time to graduate. Uh, and so I was like, well, you know, maybe I can uh, con my advisor to let me build a cell phone jammer for my thesis. And uh, that worked out great. And so I built the cell phone jammer. And, and the thing about cell phone jammers, and um, you know, I don't know if you people who aren't from America, it's actually totally illegal to use them. In some countries it is. But it's illegal to manufacture, sell, use cell phone jammers. So I was like, okay, well, I don't have to worry about anyone like ripping this off and you know, making a fortune off of it because you can't. Um, and, uh, so it turned out that you know, nobody ever, I mean, it was just too complicated and expensive to make anyways. Uh, you know, people wanted to manufacture cell phone jammers, they would do it in a simpler way. Uh, but it turned out that I instead just got hate mail saying I'm a terrorist because I'm showing, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda how to build cell phone jammers. And, you know, this is why we're all going to die. Uh, so, um, you know, there's always trade-offs. And then um, my final, or my second to final example, is, um, that's a very basic project that I made as a giveaway to uh, incoming students. We wanted to do something very simple that we could make, you know, 100 kids and, you know, freshmen would come in, we'd teach them how to solder, and, and it was a rush for, you know, a, a dormitory. And so it just, you know, spells letters in the air. There's actually a kit um, in the uh, goodie bag from Evil Mad Scientist that's, I think, kind of does this. And um, so I didn't actually open source it at first, and then eventually I put it up online, and, you know, I had it as a kit. And um, it, the thing is, actually, it, it was such a stupid design that uh, it was never used by anybody. I mean, people would look at it and be like, well, it's just like eight LEDs on a microcontroller. Like, you got to be kidding me. Like, why do you even bother? So it turns out that, uh, you know, putting up stuff online, if it's so basic, you don't have to worry about somebody, like, ripping it off because it was actually cheaper for them to use whatever they had in their, in their box of parts than to, you know, to use what I do. And this, and this is, you know, this, people ask me a lot about, like, well, you know, you put your files up where people manufacture and sell this. And so this is actually uh, the final example of a project I did before Adafruit, which is a, an open source synthesizer. And the story behind this is um, my friend really wanted a TB303 rolling song. He really wanted to make techno. And these clones are like over $1,000 on eBay. They haven't been made since 1984. And it was like, you really wanted one. You couldn't afford it. And we're like, well, wait a minute, we're like analog engineers. And this is you know, a single oscillator synth. I mean, how hard can it be? So, you know, we went online, and there were all these people who made them. And we're like, okay, well, can we just, like, get your schematics, and, like, we'll build our own. We only want to make one. And they're like, no, we're not going to give it. And we're like, no, we don't want to sell them. We just want to make one. And they're like, oh, we don't want to share anything with you. And I'm like, well, you're, like, who, what do you care? And they're like, well, we're German. And I'm like, okay, okay, whatever. So, <laughs> we're argue. So, uh, so, in the end, we were so upset. <laughs> it turns out my friend's German, too. So, I don't know, maybe, whatever, for whatever reason, we were so upset, we said, fuck this. We're going to make our own clone of this, you know, old synthesizer. And we're going to do such a good job that it'll you know, put you to shame. And then nobody else will ever have to go through this frustration of, you know, wanting to build something that other people have built and have done a pretty good job and did all the research, but aren't willing to share their information. So, you know, we bought the broken synth off eBay for like 200 bucks, and we took it apart, and we traced out all the parts and the schematics, and we measured the transistors, and we figured out what was going on, you know, looked up data sheets, and... I wrote uh, a sequencer from scratch, and then, you know, sort of halfway through, we're like, well, you know, if we're going to, like, do all this work, we might as well maybe make kits for other people, because, 
know, if we're gonna make circuit boards, we might get 100 made. And so um, the thing is, is that we were actually a little worried because we did know that there was a, such a demand for these synthesizers that well, well, if we give away everything, somebody may end up, you know, taking these files and, and you know, putting us out of business, and you know, we'll lose all our money before we even get off the ground. So we actually came up with a sort of compromise. We said, all right, well, let's break even. We'll make, you know, we put twenty thousand dollars into buy all the parts and everything. That's how much it costs. And we're like, we don't want to lose that money, so let's make that money back. And then once we make that money back, then we'll release all the files open source hardware. So uh, we actually did that. What's interesting is that, you know, after two runs, we put the files up, and we're like, okay, like we're waiting for this onslaught. And it never happened. In fact, the only time that people ended up making their own versions when we didn't, is when we didn't have the kits in stock. We actually couldn't keep them in stock because they were in such high demand. That the demand ended up pushing people to say, well, I, I'm on this waiting list for a year. I'm just going to like make my own if that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, think about that. There, there is a, a difference between, um, you know, putting stuff online and, and your worst fears occurring and what actually does occur. And, you know, now, uh, I'm actually not interested in this project anymore. It's, it's old enough that I've moved on to other stuff. Um, but um, I'm lucky because there's other people making them. And so there's like about a half a dozen or a dozen individuals and companies that are manufacturing this kit. And uh, it's good because we designed and documented it well enough that um, there'll be plenty of asset techno uh, for all of us uh, well into the future, uh, which I think is great. Other people may dislike, but I hate house music, so that's how it is. Um, but what's interesting, and this is a, 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 a weird thing that occurred, is because it became such a ubiquitous design, like every TV 303 clone out there pretty much is a derivative of the Zox box, and there's like a, quite a few of them now, is that we now see people manufacturing this, uh, you know, for sale in, in stores, and we say, hey, you know, our license kind of asks that we just put some attribution on, just say, you know, this was based on the Zox box designed by Adafruit or maybe Ada or whatever, and they say, well, um, you have to prove to me that you designed it because I don't believe you. That's how ubiquitous it got. Um, or maybe they're just assholes, I don't know. Anyways, so uh, after this is when I started the business. So that, that's the end. That's the, that, this is all the stuff that happened before. And so, you know, after the business, now, now when I make stuff, I actually release the files immediately. I don't worry about this breaking even thing because I've determined that uh, it actually doesn't matter. So now I'm actually going to uh, talk about the reasons why, more generally, instead of just examples. Okay. So, uh, it doesn't seem like it makes any sense whatsoever to do open source hardware, right? I mean, like, come on, let's like, think about it like, logically. Because if you do something that's good, it'll probably be stolen from you. And if you do something bad, you'll be made fun of, right? So there's actually, like, there's only that mediocre middle way, but you'll just be normal. <laughs> Um, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the reasons I like to do open source hardware, and I think a lot of people do, is because, they're, you know, they want to show off what they've done. And I think that, unfortunately, there is, a, there is this cloud that goes with the silver lining. When you release stuff, especially online, um, I think people online, they want to seem smarter by critiquing what you've done. And so, you know, I release projects I've worked on for months or a year or more. And you know, there's always going to be like a couple dozen people who email me and say like, you're really stupid for picking that op app. And I'm like, maybe I spec that op app for a reason, jerk. But it still <laughs> frustrates me, right? It still frustrates me and it hurts my feelings because I'm human. And of course it hurts when somebody says like, oh, your design totally stops, sucks, and this is stupid, and this is baby programming for pot smokers. Like, of course it hurts our feelings, right? So what I'm saying is that what we can do, perhaps, <laughs> Um, what we can do is maybe figure out a way to get all these people who, 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 you know, in actuality are just jealous because they don't have the ability to do what you know, they're looking at, you know, right? It's like the, it's like the, you know, it's like you, you spend so much time on that one away. It just means that, like, you know, I wish I could have spent that much time instead of going to be watching, like, The Wire or whatever, 24 hours. And I think that if we can bring these people in and make them part of the community so that they have something to share, and I think open source software does this a little bit better, but we're, we're still starting out. Get these people who are haters and bring them in and, and make them part of the community. And I think that will, uh, I think that will solve some of the problems. But you know, just be aware that if, if you're relying on external validation only, that um, you will get crushed a little bit. Okay, and so here's a, another thing, and this is a question that um, I get asked a lot, and usually it's a 
comes right after the question or comment, well, I'd really like to do open source hard work, but what if something really bad happens, right? What if someone manufactures my design and starts making money off of it, and he doesn't share it with me? Or, you know, what if I'm cloned in China? Or, you know, what if I'm ignored, or whatever? And it, it turns out that um, I always kind of imagine, like, the Arduino team at breakfast every morning, kind of like, sits there and is like, what, what the fuck were we thinking? Right? There's a lot of stupid ideas, especially like every day where they're like, it's like 9 a.m. they're reading the paper and there's like another Arduino killer in the news, right? So, um, but I think it's important, and, and why I'm not talking about business so much in this talk is there is a big difference between doing open source hardware and running a business. And trust me, you can be very good at open source hardware and very bad at running a business, right? And vice versa. And both. And you can be bad at both. But the thing is that uh, if, if you do have what's open source hardware, whether or not you succeed at running your business, which is, again, a completely different skill set, right, which is unrelated, uh, your project will at least live on. And I think that, uh, you know, we'll go back to the slide, being obscure is worse than uh, being ubiquitous. And also, uh, you know, and I, see, and I do see a lot of, like, clones of my stuff all over the place, and, and you know, people making derivatives, and not attributing me as, you know, one thing, or, like, denying that I even made it in the first place, asking me to prove that I made it. And I think that, uh, you know, yeah, it gets me frustrated, and I have fear, and frustration, and anger, and sadness, but uh, you have to reframe it a little bit. And, you know, okay, sure, it is a little annoying to me sometimes that there's people mass manufacturing my synthesizer and not giving me attribution, perhaps. But on the other hand, it's kind of great that there's so many of these synthesizers out there. And then all the designs that they wanted to manufacture, they chose mine because it was the best. Right? I mean, think about it that way. Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, well, it's about, right? I mean, if, you, if you're getting, it, it's like, right, the piracy is a, a tax on success. Right? I mean, like, there's no copyright zooms on Canal Street, right? <laughs> you know? So think about it that way, right? And this is it. it is, you know, it's always, whether or not you open source, of course, it's not going to matter. But you can't think of it that way. Uh, if somebody is making your stuff, it's because you did a really good job. Okay, another reason you might be interested in open source hardware is because you're an ideological freak. And you're just like, well, freedom is in speech, right? It's great. And I do agree with this, and I think it, you know, it's definitely a, a good motivator. And uh, you know, it, it helps people a lot. Um, there, there's definitely, um, I've learned a lot more by looking at other people's open source hardware designs and you know, seeing what they did, and you know, I respect them so much. But they chose this part, they probably did it for a reason. So I should either ask them or research more. And you know, I learned programming a lot by looking at open source software, and you know, because the code was available, I could look at it, modify it, and uh, and so that that's definitely one of the main reasons that I think you should do open source hardware as well. Uh, you can use open source hardware as a marketing term. Uh, you know, if you're running a business and you want to say, like, oh, you know, our stuff's open source hardware or open source software. Uh, you know, that that is. Um, one thing you can do, and I think a lot of people here who do run businesses are taking advantage of that. But, I would like to warn you. <laughs> if you're saying that something's open source hardware, but then you're spending all night thinking of ways you can get around open source hardware restrictions, like, oh, well, I'll put up the file, but I'll obfuscate them, or, you know, I'm going to put up the files, but later, or like, you know, you, you do all these little tricks and loopholes, I'm watching you. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, of course, the, the, the final big reason for doing open source hardware is, uh, you know, to be part of an awesome community of people, who are many of whom are here. And uh, it's fantastic. I love to work on electronics. I work with, uh, with people on electronics all the time or email. I've met awesome, great people uh, by being in open source hardware. And I think that's fantastic. And I think, again, people learn more. And uh, by sharing, they get to uh, sort of advance as engineers. Um, so, you know, there's all these reasons, and a lot of them um, are kind of like related to the individual. Like, how can my company benefit from open source hardware, or, you know, how can I benefit as engineers as open source hardware? How can I, like, save time on this project by using somebody else's design? But I also want to remind you that when we give to charity, we don't give just to get our name on a building. Right? We give to become better people. Because giving is a way to quiet that sort of whiny, annoying toddler inside of us that's selfish and grabby. So giving away is a way of sort of releasing that and, and sort of 
growing up and, and not just being um, you know, so grabby and selfish, but giving to other people and giving without asking to have necessarily our name on the building, just because we know it's important to give. And one of the nice things I like is that uh, it is, in a sense, viral, and I don't mean in uh, you know, the GPL sense of the word viral, but rather, uh, you know, I give and then, you know, maybe I inspire other people to give because they're like, well, you know, if like she can do it, and like she's a girl, I mean, like, how hard can it be? <laughs> right? So maybe I'll do open source hardware too, and I think I've tried to convince some people to do open source hardware. I mean, it's not for everybody, I will agree, but I've tried to convince some people to join in because I think it's important. So, you who have donated to open source hardware by giving your designs are awesome. I just wanted to work with that slide. Okay, so I want to sort of finish up with uh, this quote from Nina Paley. I really like Nina Paley, she's an artist, uh, not necessarily an engineer, but uh, she sort of talks about artwork, and you can think of your engineering projects this way, as children that need to grow up and sort of move on. And, and again, not try to, to be grabby and, and selfish and keep it to yourself. But let it go. And yeah, it's going to be mistakes. And there's going to be things that happen that don't make you comfortable. Just like, you know, if you have little sisters or children or, or little brothers, you'll see the same thing. And they'll make the same mistakes you did, but that's just part of the process. And that's part of them growing up. And, you know, both you and your project. So, to wrap up, too long, didn't listen. Okay, we'll pay attention now. <laughs> So why do I create open source hardware? <clears throat> okay, so one is to join a community. I have this, you know, example for all of these. So when I was an undergrad at MIT, um, you know, and I was like a sophomore freshman, there was this totally awesome guy, a big man on campus. His name was Buddy Wang. He was so cool, okay? Everybody wanted to know Buddy, because he was like this rock star engineer, and he cracked his Xbox, he was awesome, and I was like, wow, but like, I was an undergrad, so like, I wasn't cool enough to talk to him, but now I talk to him every day, because we work together at Open Source Hardware. <laughs> So I remember I talked to my roommate who did the division art, and I said like, hey, can you like give me some ideas on how to do this sort of stuff so I want to build it? And he's like, eh, not so much. Wasn't really interested in sharing. Well, he died unexpectedly a few years later. And um, everything that he made, and he made fantastic, beautiful art, is kind of unmaintainable. I mean, there's like two or three people who know how to maintain it, but for the most part, it's, it's kind of stuck in a crate. And sometimes he gets pulled out and like somebody can go in and try to make it work, but because he never released, I mean, I don't even think that he even thought this was a possibility. He didn't release the schematics, he didn't release the design files, he didn't release the firmware or the source code. It, it, it's just this mass, and, it, and it's a little sad to me because it's such great art, and it doesn't live on beyond him. You know? So, I, w I wish he would have open source stuff, I don't know. Maybe if open source hardware had been around and, and more popular, he would have considered it. Um, and finally, um, I do open source, open source hardware, uh, you know, because I think it makes me a better engineer. Uh, and engineering is really important to me because it's sort of my, my art form. And when you're designing something just for yourself, you're going to take a lot of shortcuts and you're not going to do a very good job. You're not going to document stuff. You're not going to take the care that you will take when you know that 10,000 people are going to be looking at it and critiquing it and asking you questions and trying to build it. So I think that when I... Uh, do projects now, I, I try to do a better job of designing and documenting, and, and I feel like I've become a better engineer, slowly but surely, um, without having to get like a real engineer job, which is kind of a bonus. <laughs> um, so I want to finish and say, you always give back, you always get back more than what you give. So uh, please give. Thank you. And then